involved in the whole issue of uh, the what we could call the, incons the alternative conspiracy theories of 9-11. Um, apparently, if it's not official, it's called a conspiracy theory, but if it's an, an official version, it's just called a conspiracy. So, um, as has been pointed out, in um, the case of 9-11, there are two conspiracy theories, the official one and the unofficial one. And uh, Nick has written a book called Terror on the Tube, which is just due to be published in the second edition. Um, the second edition includes quite a lot of information about the, uh, the uh, inquest, um, which he attended uh, uh, in, in the Royal Courts of Justice. And uh, also, it's got another, uh, some more information as well. So, and Nick at the moment is they're trying to set up an image so that people walking by can actually get a picture of what the talk's about since it wasn't actually officially programmed. So in a few minutes Nick will be able to make a start. So I'd like to hand it over to Nick Collestrom. Um, he's, he's invited me to add uh, odd comments so I might uh, be breaking up with uh, a few other comments. In fact, interestingly enough, we both gave the first talk on 7-7 uh, very soon after it happened in the Green Gathering in 2007. Okay, welcome everyone. And uh, we're going to review some of the fast-moving developments in uh, what's in a sense the most crucial and decisive act in the new millennium in this country. Uh, a massive attack on central London where it is immediately assumed and we're told that Muslims did it. And the more closely you look at the story, the more it comes apart. The more the official story fails to make sense. And uh, so a new kind of group of people who call themselves tr truth activists get together and try and mull over. Why are we given a story that's so inconsistent and so impossible? And how come none of the British media will discuss any alternative point of view? Why have we got this weird dichotomy that if you want to find something about the truth of what happened, you have to go on the web. And if you have to find silly, daft stories that Charlie Temenardi believe about it, you read the newspapers. But what happened to investigative journalism? We had a five-month inquest that's just recently finished on 7-7. Now, that had hundreds of witnesses, okay? What it did not have was any intelligent mind evaluating what was being said. That was supposed to be uh, an inquest. Halfway through the inquest, it turns out nobody had done any post mortems on the bodies. 52 bodies, major catastrophe, uh, uh, and somehow, oh, fancy that, they didn't do any inquests. Uh, that's just one aspect of a sense that things are being covered up. Why is everything of central importance being covered up so, so uh, we, we can't quite follow it anymore? That inquest had a smarmy lawyer, Hugo Keith, introducing one witness after another, and it had Lady Justice Hallett, making sure everybody felt treated, treated politely and, you know, decorum, at the Royal Court of Justice, the highest court of justice in the land. And uh, however absurd the stories, or however astonishing the new revelations came out, there was no discussion of them. <laughs> no, nobody was there to say, well, hang on a bit, uh, what about this story? Or, how come this has totally changed from what you said before? It was just uh, five months of, of a whole lot of information, some of it deceptive. There were untrue witnesses there, uh, but a lot of them were quite genuine witnesses giving their story, uh, and I was commenting all the time uh, on my website, which is a kind of follow-up to my book, Terror on the Tube. Um, for example, I'll give you one example. Uh, uh, the Edgeway Road coach, where allegedly Mohammed Sidi Khan blew up his, uh, his, his rucksack, was found to have two huge holes at different ends of the carriage. One on one side, one on the other. Ran out the middle of the carriage, one on one side, one on the other. And we got graphic accounts in the inquest of... of oh, right. Uh, this is the kind of thing that was shown at the inquest. Very helpful information, okay? all the different people where they were sitting exactly. So we got a load of information from, from that inquest. And uh, I'm just giving an example of the Edgware Road coach where Khan was supposedly sitting. No credible witness saw him at all. 
and I had I had nobody sitting either side of him because I didn't want people being in the winter saying no, I didn't see any sign of him. Um, and he was supposedly sitting there with his rucksack, and you had these two huge holes and graphic terif well, graphic accounts of people in the darkness after the shattering explosion uh, filling their way on the metal floor with the metal uh, twisted up as if something had blown up from underneath, uh, uh, and they were filling their way around these huge holes, and each of those two holes have somebody fell into it. One of them fell in and died, the other fell in and got out. So we have totally graphic accounts. And then the Edgeware Road train driver, Mr. Ray Whitehurst, was, was allowed to speak. Now, when I researched my book, nobody knew who the Edgeware Road train driver was. We couldn't get his identity. So he was carefully guarded, put into the inquest, and he gave his account. Oh, he walks down through the front coach, all the manhole, it's in the second coach that blew up in Edgeware Road, right? All the manhole covers are blown out on the first coach, as if some pressure from underneath had blown them out. And then he can't go through from the first coach to the second because of the hole immediately, which he can see immediately in front of him, right at the very 